Alrighty, well, welcome everyone. Um, it, this is the first webinar of a, a group of four webinars. Um, the, we'll be talking a little bit about the power of cultural storytelling and, and place-based narrative. The webinar will be presented by myself, uh, Selwyn Ramp, and um, I'm assisted, I guess, by uh, Heather Shelton. Um, we work for the Muse Web Foundation and we've partnered with the Smithsonian on producing some of these uh, webinars. The webinar is recorded, and in um, will the, the slide sh the slide version will be shared on the slide share below, um, on the screen, and we will also uh, participants will be sending a link to the recorded version of the of this webinar as well. When we're talking the power of cultural storytelling, I think it's important to start with what is cultural storytelling, um, and cultural storytelling really. There's a huge variety of what it can be, and uh, for example, the image of the pesto burger on the background here, um, that certainly is culture, and it, it, it makes you think about what, what is really um, the, the, the talking about this burger. It's not just a, a burger on a grill, but it's like, how does this taste? How does it feel? How, how juicy is it? Um, those kind of things are things that you think about with cultural storytelling. Um, presented in a way that other people are interested in it. And I think when we're talking about cultural storytelling, it's important to step back a little and, and really dive in uh, to what is a story and what is um, storytelling in general. That there have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but in the history of the world, there are no societies that did not tell stories. Because stories is something that is so ingrained to us to explain what is around us, um, that it is, uh, even to invent a wheel, we needed to come up with a story to explain what you wanted to do with a wheel first, to be able to even imagine, to come up with a solution that is round and that moves from A to B. Um, and as Lisa uh, Krohn mentioned from uh, wiredforstory.com, which by the way is a, is a wonderful website with more resources that I, I do want to point out, um, story is what makes us human. It's not just metaphorically, but it's literally what makes us a person, what makes us someone participating in a society. Being so extremely at the core of what we do, when we're th thinking about then why storytelling and what is storytelling, um, stories are one of the most effective ways in which we, uh, we communicate our, our view of reality with, other, uh, with others. So it's not just the reality, but it's our version of the reality. Most people watching this webinar um, are, are working in the cultural sector, and so I don't want to hang too long on the idea of storytelling, because I think at the core, what we do in museums, cultural institutions, and, and when we talk about culture, so much is about storytelling. Um, that we're creating, um, as Pamela Rutledge, uh, Rutledge mentioned, uh, by, by creating an authentic meaning and a purpose, um, a story gives something others can believe in, participate in and share. Um, and as, as such, it is the basis for cultural and social, social change. Pamela Rutledge mentioned this uh, in relation to, to working with businesses, communities, and uh, thinking about it as a, as a, as a um, marketing tool in many ways. Stories are a way to market our history. Um, and that, that sounds very stiff in a way, but it's a, it's a way to make, make history be more than just numbers, dates, and, um, and, and, and objects. And so in general, the elements of storytelling Stories always and, and need a beginning, middle, and end. And I would say, even though this discusses in general storytelling, I would say when you're talking about oral histories or um, cultural storytelling in general, I would say this is a major part of it as well. So even if you're interviewing someone for an oral history, think about where they start talking, where what what's kind of the climax in it and, and, and how the story ends that they're telling. Um, and this may require some editing um, after an interview to really get the core of what, what idea they are presenting to you as, as being interviewed, but also as what you're trying to, um, to record for future use in that manner for, as an oral history. So even though these elements of storytelling may, may directly relate to um, storytelling in general, 
think creatively and think for a moment also about uh, oral histories and cultural stories as well. Because at, in the first, it's like, well, when I'm interviewing someone, the beginning, middle, and end, that doesn't make sense because people say whatever they want to say when you're interviewing. But maybe this is something you can guide along with a uh, select group of questions and follow-up questions. And this is where this, the skill, I would say, of, um, of editing comes in um, to make sure that a 45-minute conversation can be brought down to a couple of minutes of really valuable uh, story that people are interested in and, and, and captivates people. Same again, stories should have a main character or even a hero. Uh, Time-lapse suspended plot. In, in many ways, that, that, that follows up on the beginning, middle, and end. Um, but even in oral history, there is someone telling you a story from either when they're young or something that happened to them. And so the person telling you, which uh, in, many, in many ways becomes the hero of the story they're telling you, which that personal experience is one of the strongest, uh, strongest aspects of, uh, of, I would say, oral histories, even beyond just a book way of storytelling, I would say, or, or, or a fantasy story. Um, the amazing thing with, with cultural stories is that you actually can talk to either someone who knew the hero, the main character, or who um, knows about this main character. It's not just an imaginative native th uh, person, but it's actually someone there that connects it. So stories should have a purpose and a need to tell the story, uh, to propel it. Um, the strongest stories that you will see in your entire life are, um, or that you will listen to um, or watch in, 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 in your life are going to be stories that are, are driven by passion. There is a passion, a, a wanting to share something with someone else. And again, going back to that earlier idea of a way to present it beyond dry facts allows people to, um, to make a story come to life, help people um, transform into uh, almost witnessing a story. And then uh, the, the fourth point of, of elements of storytelling um, is that stories create an experience that evokes emotional response. Those are often the, the, the strongest stories. And um, this is across the board from cultural storytelling to, I would say, commercials. I don't know how many of you guys watched the Super Bowl uh, in, what, two nights ago? But I would say the strongest commercials even in between the Super Bowl and, and even this year's Super Bowl itself is that emotional response, um, is that emotional connection that you have with, with an event that you're watching. And uh, as a result, makes you think about what's happening in front of you as that commercial, as that Super Bowl, as that story that's being told to you on a deeper level. It connects you on a deeper level than just uh, almost like a, a passing by text that you quickly look at or um, a dry presentation of facts. So having read this book, uh, Tribes, a little while back by Seth Godin, um, I thought he, he, he put it very interestingly um, that people don't believe what you tell them. Uh, and, and in many cases, this is a challenge that um, that even commercials, but also museums and, and, and anyone trying to present anything to an unknown party has, um, has that, that challenge. They rarely believe, even if we show them the actual objects or show them the proof, they still rarely believe it. However, once we can build that connection that, they, that the um, person experiencing your stories almost starts seeing you as a friend, or there is someone who tells a, a, another friend a story, people often believe it. And if, that, if they often believe whatever their friends tell them, they will continue to telling it themselves, and they will always believe what people tell themselves. And Seth Godin continues, is what, what leaders do is they give people stories they can tell themselves, because that is the biggest possibility for, for transformation, for believing in, in a cause or believing in that story. And often these stories are about the future and about change and how to um, make a better place, whether that is a leader at a workplace, 
at a cultural institution, or from a community organization. It doesn't matter. Someone, I want to jump in on that just yes. quickly. Um, this is sort of a, a, a to be continued with this slide because one of our additional sessions has to do with sharing stories and getting your stories out to the masses, so to speak, via social media. So think about these slides as they relate to things like Facebook feeds and stories, how they're propagated over social media, whether they're true or not, but how people believe the stories that are shared by their friends. So think about that for a future session. That's going to be one of the sessions that we give in the webinar is, is taking the powerful stories that you create and um, giving them sort of mass appeal in social media. Now, having briefly skimmed over what uh, what storytelling in general is and, and, and what a good story creates. We, we can go back to what cultural storytelling really is. How it differs, but also how it's the same as storytelling in general. I always argue um, the value of a cultural object is only as great as a story that belongs with it. Now, there might be some museums that, that would argue different than me. Um, but I would say that an object, for example, um, the Parthenon, I believe it's on the background, it's not about the actual stone that's there. It's about the story of what people did with that stone, what society belonged to those stones, to that building, and what is left over of that. Um, and we see this over and over when museums are collecting objects. They are collecting objects because the objects represent a larger story. In and of itself, the object may only be worth next to nothing, but because the person creating the object or the person handling the object or how the object was used, it's those kind of stories that, that add the, to the value of that object and in return it makes it a valuable object to collect and to preserve for future generations. Yes, the objects are important. However, we need to go beyond just presenting objects and making sure that all of these stories connected to objects. And think of objects in the largest kind of scale. Think of, of objects even as the size of a building or larger, a city. Um, so I'm, I'm really taking object as a, as a very broad term. The stories are at least as important as these objects. And as long as we make sure that the that the stories are presented, not just recorded, but that they will actually be presented and shared, we can actually help increase the value of these cultural objects. As a result, help people understand why these objects or why this history is important to be shared and continue to be shared and is relevant to what we're doing today. Cultural storytelling is a lot. And it's varied, as I said. It can happen in a museum, it can happen in a city-wide, in a building. Um, it's about an experience. But there are a couple of things I would say cultural storytelling is not, because there are other places and organizations that do it much better. Cultural storytelling is not knowing the exact date. It is not about, was it 1847 or 1748? I don't remember. Cultural storytelling is about the experience. So in that case, it was around 1850. That is close enough. Now, in this case, there, there's a hundred years difference there. That might be more of a challenge because the stories related to 1748 and 1847 may be quite different. But a rough estimate in a story is plenty of what you would need to know to be able to um, create an environment that you're your participant in a story, your, your listener or your viewer, can start understanding and connecting with your story. Knowing the exact spelling of a name. Cultural storytelling is not about the grammar. Was it with CH or with a K? How do I spell Christina? Ultimately, whether it was with CH or K, it was Christina who um, did something, was somewhere. And I am not arguing that exact dates and names and the spelling of names is not important. But there are, I would argue, museum institutions, historical centers um, that will have these kind of facts exactly listed and are making sure that these facts are preserved for the future. If you can add these facts into your story, great. But ultimately for the story, for the cultural story, it is 
secondary of importance. Um, and maybe more worth of, instead of listing all the dates, it may be worth more referring to the cultural center or the signage or wherever you can find the exact information of spelling or dates. I would also argue that cultural storing is not the only true or valid story. Maybe some of you guys will know the movie Cars, and this says something about me, but I personally love that movie. But uh, the, 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 the speech below kind of came from that idea, and if you know the movie, it's, it's about a kind of a dusty town, the original Cars movie, um, where the highway was put in and the, the town kind of died, and they used to, the traffic used to come right through the town, and there was lots of a bruising excitement, but with a highway built, it bypassed the town. That is great. People traveling that road, they love the road, but at the same time, the community that was right next to it, it might have actually cut into people's backyards, or as in the movie of the cars, it kind of died, this, uh, it made this town die, and it needed this brilliant new idea and excitement in the community to kind of revamp that town. And so it is not that there is only one true or valid story, it's a perspective. Um, and it's how one person would see something versus another person seeing something. And then the first, the fourth, which is kind of a continuation of that, it's not always the voice of authority. Certainly authority, I, again, same like dates, it's not that it's not important, but it may not be important for cultural storytelling. It's not about how my professor said the date was 1847, but it's about the, per, the experience, the personal experience of what it was being there, or when I remember when. It is the, personal, the personalization of, your, um, the, of the culture and the cultural objects and the facts and the factual history. In a way, it allows the history to be augmented, um, to be uh, brought to life. It's not about the dry facts of what happened when and how. It is about what the experience. It's about the being there, about being able to share how it feels, how that burger tasted. And so when I would add that if people are familiar with the expression, history is written by the winners, um, this is not that situation. This is not a situation where those who conquered a, a, a country or a, a village were ultimately the ones that, that had their say in how that uh, battle went. This is an instance where everybody's story matters, and ultimately it's the multiplicity of those voices that gives cultural storytelling its richness. That's, that's very true, yes. And um, I am currently based out of Baltimore, and I would say that is very true. Many people will, will know Baltimore right now as the city of riots and the uprising. Working in Baltimore a lot of my days, uh, I can tell you this, uh, this city is about much more than just that. It's not about the TV series, The Wire. It's certainly, that is part of the city, but the cultural richness in the city um, is much broader than that. And in fact, it's broader than what it's presented as in, say, the museums or the historical society. They do a great job, but there are more stories and more cultural stories that are part of this um, fabric of storytelling, a fabric of cultural stories that surrounds the city, whether they're recorded or not. Um, I would say every place at this point on Earth probably has a fabric of cultural stories. So diving a little deeper into cultural storytelling. Cultural storytelling is authentic perspectives about local cultural and natural res resources. It's that authenticity that makes it special. It's that perspective that is important. It's told by the people who know them best. And in that may be the museum, that may be a community member, there is a cultural perspective of a visitor as well to any community. Um, and all of these are relevant and can all be valid. A colorful interpretation of dry facts, as we mentioned before, what it is not. It's not the dry facts. It's creating context to these facts. It's bringing these kind of uh, facts to life. It is a way to, to diversify and amplify your community voices. Um, everyone has a story to tell. If you really start asking people, simply by being alive, what makes us human is these experiences that we go through every single day of our lives. And some are worth sharing, some may not be, but ultimately these kind of social 
experiences that we have are going around the world and going around our community and driving into work, you might witness something. Those can, uh, can ultimately be cultural stories. And so I know Heather, for example, is, is very much a, um, a water um, person. Yeah. And so a lot of Heather's cultural stories have often a relation to water. And, and in fact, often when Heather and I um, are talking, some of these stories just randomly pop up because of something we're talking about reminds her of it. Um, and that's that, especially the, the, the stories that randomly pop into people's minds when you're talking about a river or a beach or uh, what it is to be somewhere when you, when you smell a certain smell, those are often the stories that really make something come to life. It is stories really as a result are a means to, uh, to connect communities, people and common causes. Um, and I'm just thinking, Heather, of the story that you told me about it, what it is to, to smell the water, the riverside, or the, 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 the coastal side, I guess. You mind elaborating a little? Because I think that really helps me realize what for me it is to have a cultural story to, that's worth sharing. Sure. So um, I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, which is on the coast of Virginia. And we uh, were surrounded by waterways, obviously, but a lot of these waterways were, were tidal and were connected to various um, streams and bays, etc., with the, the big bay being the Chesapeake, of course. Uh, but the tidal pools that were around the place that I lived were obviously, obviously subject to the, the daily tides. And when it was low tide, the area near the waterway uh, smelled really bad. And if you can imagine, just for a second, to close your eyes and imagine what the worst rotten egg smell is in the world, that's pretty much a pretty accurate explanation for how the tide smells at low tide in these coastal regions. And so the mud had a specific aroma um, that, that I associate with, with arriving back in the Hampton Roads region of Virginia. And it's a very visceral response that I have to that, that smell. So even a smell or even an experience um, that you might have had when you were a child is something that might be worth sharing with others as a way of connecting people in different regions or connecting people who have a shared experience. I was actually thinking about uh, stories and having heard the story from Heather, I, I figured that was just one of the visual thoughts that I've had um, when thinking about storytelling, just because it's... It, it, I'm from a tidal region myself, and I very much understand that smell of rotten eggs. But this also goes in, um, in effect on the facts, on the facts that we mentioned before, what storytelling is not. Because was that really a region really full of rotten eggs? Probably not, quite certainly not. But it's still, it still, it, it demonstrates the feel of what it was to be there. Uh, I would say that is exactly what a cultural story, tell, a story would be. Um, and these kind of stories are, are really can, can share and connect people um, at home and around the world. In fact, Heather is from Virginia Beach. I am originally from Europe, grown up in very different regions of the world, but somehow we have this shared connection and this shared remembrance of this smell, yet we've never, we, we haven't grown up in the same area and we have very different, different ways of growing up in, in different times and different uh, environments. Um, and so it, it really storytelling and, and helping people imagine what it is like um, helps people connect, connect on a level that's more than just, um, oh, I grew up in a coastal region. It's about the experience of being there. And this is a very maybe rough exercise because Heather's story was not beautifully produced, but there's something there. So it's it's a natural way to to go from beyond presenting something of cultural history to having a dialogue with your audience. Just by hearing Heather talk about the coastal region brought me back for a moment of, of growing up there and thinking about, yeah, she's right, it really was rotten eggs. And so immediately by that story, she's able to build a connection that goes beyond, uh, that goes beyond just the, the, the presentation of dry facts. It also means perspectives matter, and I, I, uh, I, I love this little uh, graphic. It's not about the authority, because the authority might know that this is a six or a nine. I don't even know. But it is about how people experience a certain place, whether it's the mud that's smelling or it smells like rotten eggs. 
it's it's about a per local perspective of a certain particular person. And since we're talking about tidal regions anyway, I had to put this one in as as extreme as uh, perspectives matter and both are very valid perspectives. It, it's not that one is wrong than the other. In fact, in both uh, both sides of this slide are correct. There is water and there is a boat. But it is about how people experience each that is worth sharing and ultimately builds up an, this rich fabric of storytelling. Going forward, um, the elements of cultural storytelling, and we're, we're of course using a lot of slides with what we're talking about today, and stories happen in all kinds of different ways. I mean, we know books, we know historical books, we know images, uh, videos, audio, and maybe what people don't necessarily think about in cultural or storytelling, but that I certainly would want to uh, draw attention to is location. Location is probably what puts cultural storytelling, what sets cultural storytelling apart from fantasy storytelling most. Because every single story is related to a, um, a specific location. And because we know or we can talk about this specific location, it can lead to an, a level of immersion that, sure, a fantasy book can, can give you kind of an immersion, but if you're able to connect your story to a, real, to a real location and a real place and time, it allows you to experience another level of um, storytelling that you may not be able to if it's just an artificial place or an artificial uh, story that you don't know the relevance. So Heather did it immediately when she was talking about this story about coastal. She mentioned coastal Virginia and how that has a specific scent. It might be very different than the River Delta, the um, Mobile Delta in Alabama. That brings us to uh, geolocation. Um, geolocation is the identification of real world geographic location of a point of interest. And again, this might be something in a museum, it might be some, uh, a um, school at a certain time that someone's talking about, it may be a city, it may be a village, it doesn't matter. But what cultural storytelling is, it augments this real location or this real object to make sure that the story is relevant in a certain area in a certain time, even if the facts are not 100% of what the history books tell you. While working on, on a variety of these projects, um, I came across the following story that even though we cannot right now go to Minnesota, um, I want to uh, have you guys listen to the following story look at the pictures while they appear to think about what immersive stories can be, what this cultural storytelling can do beyond the simple presentation of, of the facts. We're Don Muskeski and my wife Becky Muskeski and we live on the Osoa River, the south of Mankato. We moved out here in 04 just to get out of the city and out in the country so we could kind of spread our wings a little bit and not be so crowded. It was just a dream of our side live out in the country and being by water was really important. We also are huge wildlife lovers and so we enjoy the abundance of birds and deer and... Yes, we also have turkeys and other things and, it, and it's quiet, peaceful. You can actually go in the backyard and enjoy quiet and hear a little bit of the river. Then things got a little stressful as the backyard started to disappear. In 2010, the train of thunderstorms that went across the southern part of the watershed. And we lost 20 to 25 feet in our backyard within a day and a half. Actually, I think it rained on Thursday and Friday. By Friday night, it was getting quite high. The next morning was when we all of a sudden started hearing and seeing it drop into the river. And I actually wasn't home at the time, and I got a call from my neighbor. He said, you need to come home right away, because your house is going to go in the river. Don, you were here, I believe, at that time, I think. I was. Mm -hmm. It went down in clumps. You could hear it, and you could smell it. You could smell the dirt in the air. And the river had a whole growl to it, which was a little frightening when you sit there and you watch your land disappear. We didn't know how much was going to go at Saturday night. We didn't know what we'd wake up to in the morning. We got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday, it had 
got it had peaked and it had gotten to its closest point to us. Mm -hmm. Probably between the my deck and the edge of it, we have maybe 15 feet. People that have lived out here for 30 years never seen the river that high, ever. Not even close to that. Well, that's why we got involved with this uh, the Silver River Watershed uh, group four years ago. Basically, what we're trying to do is slow down the water. Slow down how quick it gets to the river. So we all know we can't control how much it's going to rain, but you can stop how quickly it comes so it doesn't hit the Lesseur River so quickly. We're working with uh, farmers to set up drainage ponds so that that water can be metered to the river as opposed to it going directly from tile into ditch into river. And we're making progress. We love living here. This is our life here. We don't want to have to move. So that was actually a what I would say well-produced oral history. Um, it not coincidentally had three photographs appear at different times. Um, those also matched the beginning, middle, and end of the story. Um, and also allowed you to experience not just the um, thinking what it must be like, but it could allow, allows you to relate it to a specific area and a specific location of, of the river, but behind the two people here. And that's what I would say the geolocation, even if it's not presented every single time when you hear the story, the fact that we're able to tie it to this actual event and actual location allows us to augment these stories even more. Now, what can happen if you have a couple of these kind of oral histories of a couple of seconds, couple of minutes, if you start presenting them as a group um, of people up along that river, the, the whole becomes greater than some of the parts. And stories grouped around a, a theme can create a greater narrative, can help um, people telling this story of this flood of these thunderstorms and the damage they did in Minnesota to create a greater narrative. And it can even uh, create, uh, help creating a cause or a movement, um, as they mentioned in their story, to prevent this from happening. Um, and it's not the individual story that would do that, but by grouping more of these stories together, you can really help present it as that. Very quickly, we start talking about tours. And if some of you guys are working at museums or historical societies, we may be very familiar with tours. But if not, I quickly wanted to throw it in there that a tour is usually 10 to 15 stops. People can listen to oral histories usually or, or uh, stories about locations for about one to three minutes. We live in a society that moves very fast. Not many people will spend the time uh, listening to an introduction of 45 minutes. Even if there is a greater depth of these kind of oral histories and these kind of stories, cultural stories, an introduction to it of one to three minutes would be a really good start. And if people are actually interested, then they can spend more time and decide to allocate more time and listen either to the next story or go online and find out more about this, the thunderstorms or this flood or whatever oral history or cultural story you're presenting. And so I just wanted to put this slide with, with thanks to Google, we have the amazing capability to, to present these kind of stories as truly a tour and, and locate them around the neighborhood and help a neighborhood think about what it is to be together, how different objects or different buildings or in your museum uh, different areas of your museum work together to really present and help people change their minds or, or shape their minds on, on what stories present and what cause they're following or they're listening to. And these 10 buildings that or 11 buildings that you see here um, that are located, individually they might never have told the story about um, what exactly happened in this neighborhood in Baltimore, which in fact all of these were originally industrial buildings and now have turned into more of an arts district. And so there is a, a huge change of, um, of kind of the, the history of this industrial area that's now becoming very much an artistic area and there is a art school that's using some of them and it's together you're starting to see that this this change of industry to arts has really shaped the neighborhood. Where if I would have presented that with one single building, I couldn't have said anything about what the whole narrative of this neighborhood 
from the perspective of arts to industry is. Other people might present it from a gentrification perspective, and others might be presenting it from even another perspective, developers perhaps. Um, and so that already shows you that even talking about this arts to industry, there are a variety of, of cultural stories connected to it, and it really, the strongest kind of presentation is if there's a grouping of stories that's all related to each other. For in the classroom space, the idea that individual students or groups of students could work on projects that ultimately could be grouped together um, in a tour of some sort that has a, a sequence or a chronology, it really does add to the ability of, of something to have a greater impact. So if one student took building A and another student took building B and then ultimately they become part of a tour of a community or, or a part of the explanation of a historical event, giving it context rather than a, a one-off experience that really doesn't have relation to other events or, or buildings in the community, that's where the power of this is, not only in its uh, ability to be shared, but also in its, in ab its ability to, I think, teach students that everything is connected. It's not just a singular story. Um, all of these events, all of these buildings, all of these locations do have connection, whether that connection is a person, a place, or a thing. And so that gets me to this slide, thank you, Heather, um, of connecting communities. Ultimately, these individual stories about buildings, people, um, environments, artists, it doesn't matter. But ultimately, it allows you to connect a community. And it's not just about the cultural story, but it's also about the local business owner. And it's also about the local school. And once you start seeing these patterns, you realize how connected these communities are and how you can push that even further. By using the power of storytelling, you can start reaching out to perhaps people, businesses, organizations that may not have been accessible before. We promised to keep this webinar under an hour, and so I wanted to wrap up there for now. Here are, in fact, the uh, contact information of, of the MuseWeb staff, and I added uh, Nancy Proctor, uh, the uh, exec executive director of the MuseWeb Foundation, and feel free to reach out to us either via Twitter, via email. Um, we'd love to follow up and follow up on more of this, of course. And otherwise, we also would love for you to join in in two weeks will be our next webinar, which will actually be talking about more detail about um, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of cultural storytelling and have some examples of, of what to do and perhaps what not to do um, as, as follow-up to this webinar. And I would add, someone, we've included the hashtag of this project on the bottom of the screen. Please follow that if you're, particularly if you're on Twitter, if you're on Instagram, we tag that as well. On multiple platforms out there, whether it's YouTube or SoundCloud, we've been tagging content that's related to this larger story collecting initiative, always with Be Here Main Street. So if you're looking for examples of cultural stories or stories that might have been produced by students through the Youth Access Project, that's a good way to find them. And feel free to ping us at MuseWeb or, of course, uh, at our individual handles if you want to bring attention to a story that your students have created. And we've been doing that a lot on social media. We're, we're really excited to share the good works that have been created by students and teachers, um, particularly in Minnesota, and would love to hear and see and listen uh, to stories that are being produced in your communities as well. So please feel free to reach out to us and we will do our best to try to uh, connect users of, uh, of um, our social media channels as well as just general patrons of the arts and humanities with, with some of the stories that you're producing. And that goes right back to where we started out with, where um, the value of, of the cultural objects is in the value of the, of the use of its stories. So if we, don't, if we only record stories but not really put them to use, um, we're not reaching the full potential of these stories and, and the transformation they can have. So if no one is unmuting at this point, um, we will conclude the webinar here.